Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Charity Cup 2022, part of the Meltwater, Meltwater, Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. Uh, today, we are going to be looking at the quarterfinal and semifinal matchups uh, before telling you who made it to the finals. Uh, that is the new format this year. I'd also like to apologize because uh, it seems as though throughout my videos, whenever there's noise outside, I do apologize for it because I think it's really loud, but I guess I have a really good noise gate filter on this microphone that doesn't pick it up. And you guys always tell me I'm apologizing for nothing. So basically being Canadian. And who wants to be Canadian? Just kidding. Canadians are awesome. Uh, in this video, I have put timestamps on the video player for the semis and the quarterfinals. We have seven games to look at. We're going to go fast-paced, match by match. Here we go. The first quarterfinal matchup I would like to show you is the matchup between Magnus Carlsen and Hans Niemann. Uh, they drew their first game. Uh, Magnus won the second one. And in this third game, we had, uh, we had an interesting opening. <clears throat> Magnus decided uh, that he was going to play just kind of very standard stuff. He was going to play Jokopia, uh, Jokopianissimo with e4, d3, c3, and slowly build up for d4. And he didn't slowly build up for d4. He just played d4 right away. Uh, the thing is that uh, with Hans moving his bishop now out of the middle of the board, there's tension on these pawns on e4 and on d4. And it's really up to Magnus to, to figure out what he's going to do here. Magnus reroutes the bishop backwards and Hans explodes the center. So now we have a pawn cube. So we can basically take on e5, d5. We can see what happens. Uh, we do take on d5 and uh, we have an activation of the queen here by, um, by Hans. But in activating the queen, it also becomes a target immediately for Magnus to go back. And Magnus really doesn't look back. Uh, he offers this pawn up for a capture. If you do take it, obviously there is tactics here and the knight will come to c4. So Hans pushes the pawn forward to e4 and Magnus making good on his mistake last time of not being a subscriber to the Gotham Chess channel. Since then, did subscribe, knows about danger levels and attacks the queen and then brings his knight to e5. This is very nice. This would have not been possible because he does not control that square, but by attacking the queen, he wins the control of that square, and then he just goes forward. Rook takes e4, defends his entire position. Hans tries to break out with f5. The knight takes on c6, once again, danger levels. The rook bulldozes on e6, a move that does not look possible, but the black defenses are all done because after bishop e5, this bishop on b6 is completely stranded from the game forever unless black is able to play c5 and crack open the white center. But the other thing about this position is that white is about to target this knight. And if that knight falls, the rest of the black position completely collapses. So even though it looks like maybe unnecessary, Magnus deliberately sacrifices a rook for a bishop. Otherwise, he would be losing the bishop on f4 because the knight would take it. And then he just continues to butcher with c4, removing the knight entirely from the middle of the board. If the knight were to go back to e7, for example, there would be c5, you would come back, then I would take, and look at this, absolutely beautiful. Magnus, a pure savage with the bishop pair. Uh, Hans decides to sacrifice the material back here, but Magnus just won't stop. And then here Magnus plays something really nice. He's like, I want this knight. I'm going to deflect your queen. Hans is like, all right. Magnus is like, that's nice. Now I'm going to fork you. Hans is like, no, you won't. I'm going to check your king. Han and Magnus is like, all right, king g2. Hans is like, well, I saved my queen. I mean, I saved my knight. I'm so good. And Magnus is like, oh, that was just the beginning of your problems. Now I'm going to take on b6. All that effort that you just put in defending your knight, I've got my past pawns here. They're going to roll down to the end of the board. And that's exactly what they do. He gets two pawns on the seventh rank. And uh, yeah, it's game over because you're going to play b8 takes and e8. And you can't get close king f7. Hans plays knight f5. And uh, Magnus plays rook e6 check, and Hans resigns. If you play king f7, you are walking into a discovered attack. If you play king h7, then, um, I mean, I can probably even queen and just go like this. So, 37 moves, and me like, like hot knife through butter. I mean, honestly, just like it was tense in the middle for like one move, and then uh, I guess Hans made one inaccuracy, and the tidal wave came, sacrificing the rook, uh, removing this defense and the bishop pair just beautiful. You give Magnus the bishop pair, it's almost just not fair. I mean, it's, oh my gosh, Magnus with the bishop pair, it's just not fair. Okay, yeah, when I'm uh, sleep deprived and my throat hurts a little bit um, from allergies, uh, I get a little bit delusional. So, Magnus is our first semifinalist. He won the match two and a half to half versus Hans Niemann. The next semifinal matchup is between Le Quang Liem and David Navarre, Vietnam versus... Uh, Czech Republic, Liam won the prelims. He actually got uh, first place. Magnus was the second place finisher. 
Ginger lemon tea for the win. Uh, and this one was 1-1. So both guys won a game. Liam in game three decides to go for a two knights English and we have d5. So David Navarro going for a Grunfeld-esque position and Liam plays the move h4. h4 is beautiful. I love this stuff. I mean, just, just these flank pawn pushes to target Fian Keto setups in the King's Indian and the Grunfeld. The pawn makes it all the way to h5 and it's just a menace. I mean, it's just so annoying. Uh, Navarro is just trying to act like it's not there. He's sort of treating it like a crazy person on the New York City subway. Uh, and, you know, God bless the man, because if David Navarro applies those tactics on his next visit to New York, he absolutely will be left alone. And then when they get in your face, you just kind of skedaddle. But when they stay there, that's when it's annoying. Because now, Liam just plays as if his H-pawn isn't doing much at all. But see, now David Navarro is going to have a problem because White is ready to open the H-file at a moment's notice. The Queen is over here. The Knight is coming this way. And David's just like, I'm not scared. I don't care. I'm completely safe. You have absolutely nothing. And Liam here plays something really funny. He's like, man, wouldn't it be nice if I could link up my queen and my rook? Boop. And boop. And it's mate. But luckily for Navarra, he's able to defend it. Now, you would think here that you just play g4, g5, and you win the game. It's not so easy because if you play g5, I block your queen. And this is the last thing that you want. If you have negated all the principles of chess, like castling your king, playing in the middle, developing your pieces, just for mate. Some of you do this. Some of you beginners, you just attack with queens and other pieces, and you're like, ooga booga, ooga booga, ooga booga, I have to win the game. But then all of a sudden, you don't have mate, you haven't developed anything, you're going to lose the game. Well, you can't play like this. So Liam now has to actually consolidate, right? So he develops a little bit. He protects the pawns in front of his king. And here he plays a hilarious move. He plays the move. King f1. That move is really funny. The actual purpose of this move is just making sure that your king is safe without removing your rook from the h-file because you want to attack on the h-file in the future. You also want to have the luxury of moving your knight. So for example, maybe you want to play knight g5 in the future and make this trade and then triple on the h-file, right? So that is why you play king f1. It's an absurd move, but it happens oftentimes in Grunfels because the king is completely safe. He got a little drunk, he fell, you know, he fell asleep at the table, and now he has to crawl back to the bedroom. Queen a4. So do you trade queens if you're trying to attack? No! Block off the queen trade, all right? Knight h5, rook e1, and look at Liam. The kingdom is just moving that way. Have you ever seen a position like this? Everyone's just migrating. All of his pieces are slowly moving further and further to the right as the attack on the king side is going all in. Navarro tries to get some center space, but here's g4. Navarro bulldozes down the middle. He's like, I mean, I might as well. His king is right there. I got to open everything up. E takes d3. Bishop takes takes. The knight is gone. I mean, Liam is a couple of moves away from just winning this game on the spot. D2. The pawn is going to take the rook not so fast. Rook takes e3. He's just bowling down the middle of the board. And Liam's like... Okay. You attack my rook? Okay. F6? Danger levels. You attack my knight, but I target your queen. And now I'm forcing you into a queen trade, or I'm going to go down here and mate you. And you don't want to play this position, do you? Just down a full rook. And Navarro says, no, I don't. So I resign. And that is how Liam became our next semifinalist. Liam awaits the winner uh, of Duda's matchup. No, I apologize. Liam awaits the winner of, yes, of the Duda matchup, uh, which we will be looking at momentarily against David Anton. Uh, what a game. I mean, honestly, what a game. Hilarious game, right? Just the peace migration and everything, just everybody going over there. Awesome stuff. You love seeing chess like this, and this is why we are here for it. This next matchup between uh, Jan Krzysztof Duda and David Anton had nothing short of spectacular tactics. This was a very fun game. This was a Rui Lopez, and uh, it was uh, Bishop C5, and then uh, Duda played it like with a delayed capture on c6. Normally this move order, when it's a Berlin, is like this, right? This is what you get. But notice the difference. There's a pawn on a6. So Duda plays this kind of system, but then takes on c6. So actually, if anything, he's given black an extra tempo in the form of pawn to a6. I mean, I don't think it really matters, but it's just kind of funny. H3, A5, A4, the players meet the pawns on the queen side, and Duda rotates the knight because he wants to go bring it toward his king. Very common, in case your opponent castles short, you will be attacking him with your knights and your bishop. So, David Anton is like, well, 
I'm not gonna do that because I know what you want, so I'm gonna go long. All right, fantastic, boys. That means that if both sides have castled long, this game will not last longer than 15 moves. It is move 13, you have all of your pawns. Let's see a player win the game by move 28. C3 before F5, G5, H5, blah, 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 blah. Here we go, bishop E3, H5. Takes, takes, H4. David Anton is the first one to fulfill the prophecy of crossing the middle ground. And uh, he plays rook H5 and it's very clear he has very bad intentions for his opponent. However, uh, we have a, a gentleman by the name of Jan Krzysztof who is also trying to create an attack on his own, right? So very interesting. Who is going to be successful? If you give white a couple of more moves, he is going to play moves like rook b1, uh, b4. You know, if black just only builds up, he's never actually going to get anywhere. And uh, these pawns have to go. The pawns have to be cleared out so that the rooks can bulldoze. All right. So who's going to get through first? Knight c4, queen b4. Well, that's annoying. We have to trade queens. Except we don't. Queen b4 loses on the spot. Yes. Even 2700 level super grandmasters are able to hang their queens. And that is why you should never quit chess, no matter how frustrated you get. And no, I am not saying that because your views or purchases of my paid content support me directly. I am unbiased in my promise. It does happen. And in this position, white wins the queen with the move knight takes a5, which clearly he overlooked. Knight takes a5 removes the defender of the queen, and whichever way black recaptures, black loses the queen. If black takes like this, the rook pins. I don't think that's what David Anton missed. I think he might have forgotten that his queen gets stuck if he takes with the queen. This is much more brutal, all right? This is like Dobby standing up for everybody in Malfoy Manor in Deathly Hallows, all right? You never thought that the smallest creature could possess the strongest powers. Look at that analogy. Oh my god. Are, did anybody else hear that? That was so good. Anyway, uh, he lost the queen, and it took a little bit of a little, little while. In general, when a queen fights against an army of other pieces like a rook and a bishop, a rook and a knight, it's not over unless the queen starts gobbling all the pawns. And in this case, the queen was about to. It was about to start gobbling all the pawns. Uh, and if the pieces are uncoordinated and you're down a lot of pawns, you should probably just resign. David Anton did, and Yang Krzysztof Duda is our next semifinalist to play against Le Quang Liam. And the final matchup that I would like to show you from the quarterfinals is the matchup between Ding Li Ren and Jordan Van Forest. Jordan is the third place finisher. Ding Li Ren is the uh, sixth place finisher. And Ding, I believe, um, <clears throat> is... A slight favorite in the rapid, uh, but anything is possible. Jordan goes for a queen's gambit accepted. We have a classical main line. This has been played many, many times, but Jordan doesn't play a six. A six is very common to play b5. Jordan goes for this line and then plays the move a6. But there are differences here. Uh, if you play a6 and white plays knight c3, you can just go b5. So this is a massive advantage compared to having a knight on c6 because normally this knight actually likes to be on d7. You see, on c6, the knight can oftentimes be a target for the move d4 to d5, and that's a little bit unpleasant. Uh, but okay, I mean, Jordan does it this way, and uh, we go. he goes bishop d3, Ding Li Ren. The purpose is that here you cannot take this. Very common tactical trick, bishop queen, check. And that's a discovered check, and you win the queen, so this is a nice way to protect your isolated pawn. Castles, uh, sorry, your rookie one and castles, and now we have the following position. And Ding Li Ren brings his bishop back, and obviously his idea is mate. He would like to put the knight here, he would like to play bishop g5, take the knight, and then checkmate. And that's exactly what he does. Jordan doesn't like to get checkmated, all right? He plays g6, protects that diagonal, and we have bishop a2. The point of bishop a2 is to prevent the move knight c4, <clears throat> which is why it must have been very surprising for, for Ding Li Ren when Jordan played knight c4 anyway. The other purpose of this move is that you always have sacrifices on e6, Yeah, I just streamed three hours also before I made this recap, so I apologize if my voice is a little scratchy. Hopefully you can still support. Excuse me, please. I'm trying to get my, my, uh, my, my tea in here. Anyway, it must have been surprising that the move knight c4 came because it's a pawn sacrifice. But here's the idea. Jordan is going to wreck the pawn structure. Now the white king is wide open, queen d7, rook c8, and Jordan's got a beautiful position, right? I mean, he's going to go target this, F, uh, this f3 pawn and this b2 pawn. Everything is looking good. His position makes a lot of sense, and for the temporary sacrifice of a pawn, you can't say his position has any problems. Except for the fact that the natural-looking move queen to b7 lost the game on the spot to the absolutely savage breakthrough, which Ding Liren found, d5, kabam, kaboom, and if a move looks impossible, but it is, 
it's probably a bad sign. The point of D5 is that if you take with the E-Pawn, which is what happens in the game, Dingley Ren uncorks Savagery. Rook sacrificing on E7 so that the Queen is now in the relative sight of the Bishop and this Knight over here. And now we have Knight takes D5. Uh-oh. You have to sacrifice your Queen. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'm just going to take with check and checkmate you. So, why didn't he take with a Knight? He didn't take with a Knight because then Rook takes D5. And the Bishop is protected. And if you take, I take this with my Rook and I win the game. Crazy. D5 is, is, is... The game is over. I mean, it's crazy because Jordan could have just traded queens. No queens, no problem. Get his rooks involved. But Jordan plays queen b7 and Dingley Ren just bulldozes. And remember last game I said you keep the, the queen versus the other pieces like knight and rook or rook and bishop. If it can't get the pawns, you will not win the game. Especially with a bad structure. If these two pawns and this pawn didn't exist, black might hold this because the pawns are all on the same side and the pieces can defend each other. They coordinate very well. But watch as Dingley Ren hunts down the pawns. You might say, why didn't Jordan defend them? It's not that easy. If you play a move like a5, I can even play b4. All right, I can remove one of your rooks. That's when it gets real bad. The synergy between two rooks really cannot be understated. If you lose one of your rooks and then the pawn, the game is just over. So that is what he does. He sacrifices the pawn. And even though his king is a little bit suspicious on the edge of the board, the queen side pawns will decide the game. And I just mentioned that is exactly what he's going to do. And he does it in flashy style by sacking his queen, taking the rook, converting it into a winning rook and pawn endgame. And Jordan Van Forest resigned on move 45 as Dingley Ren was ready to scoop up his eighth and final pawn. And Dingley Ren is the last person to qualify for the semi finals. Setting up the matchup, the marquee matchup, Dingley Ren, Magnus Carlsen. Dingley Ren has defeated Magnus several times uh, in recent rapid matchups. He also is considered probably the second, like the, the biggest threat to Magnus in classical rapid and blitz, considering he's beaten him in tie breaks before. The whole world wants to see a Ding versus Magnus match. The whole world also wants to see a Ferruja versus Magnus match. And the whole world always wants to see Hikaru versus Magnus, whether that be in pool noodle fighting uh, somewhere, you know, maybe in surfing, tennis, chess boxing, mud wrestling, blitz, bullet, everything in between, all right? But first, a game from the matchup between the Kuang Liem and Jan Krzysztof Duda, also semi-finalists. Uh, this one was a Queen's Gambit declined, everybody's least favorite opening, with a main line of Bishop F4 and E3, the other main line, of course, being Bishop going to G5. We have B6, Bishop uh, Pawn takes on C4, and Black here slowly begins Queenside operations with A6, B5. Very similar structure, by the way, that we just saw to the other game, except there the C Pawn took and White had an isolated Pawn position. All right, so we have Knight D7, here come the Rooks, and Liam has a very pleasant position. If you look at this, I would say Liam is just very comfortably better. He controls the center better than his opponent, and Duda just can't play C5. He just can't play the move C5, because... Takes, 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 stuff taking on c5, knight coming to e4, just very bad. I mean, if anybody's won the battle of the opening, it's Liam, and he starts to make use of that by attacking the middle, right? Once you've got all your pieces developed, you now have to start tipping the balance more and more. He could even play f4. He could even go for a stonewall lockdown on his opponent. He does it this way, and then a few moves later plays f4, and I mean, he's just much, much better. So what do you do when you're much worse? You start trading pieces. Right, yeah, well, I, he trades the rook. If white had taken with the rook like this, b4, rook d8, etc. Um, so, actually, b4 just trapped the knight. Yeah, so you have to take with the knight. So he trades rooks, he brings his rook, and uh, he plays like this. I mean, he, you know, Duda is trying to trade pieces to relieve himself of the pressure and try to maybe send this game into an endgame. But still, Liam controls everything. The center of the board is controlled by Liam. The queen side is controlled by Liam. The king side is controlled by Liam. The thing is, when you have a much better position, you can't just sit there and be like, I'm better. You actually have to win. You've made all the easy moves. Go for the win. Liam's like, okay, Gotham, I hear you. G4. I am breaking over open his king. Here comes rook G1. Here's the problem. Just because your position is better and you try to win doesn't mean you're going to win. Because now you're giving your, oppor your, your opportunities also to your opponent. Takes, takes, king f1, king f7, rook g1. And Duda's like, oh, you going over there? Oh, that's real cute because now I have a pass pawn. Hello. Now white is still better. But now white's like, damn it. His pawn's getting closer. I don't like that. B4. Duda here plays a nasty move. He plays a5. What? You can't do that. That's a free pawn. 
Well, dude is like, well, then I'm going to connect my pawns. And then I'm going to play bishop a6. And then I'm going to play c3. That doesn't look good, does it? Why would white allow any of that? Well, it turn as it turns out, a5 is not a good move. Computer here is unafraid. That's the difference between computer and human. Human doesn't like this, all this. Feels like the game is going in the wrong direction. Computer is like h4. Middle finger in the air. Uh, parents, uh, middle finger is a, a computer speak for that's not a good move and my move is better. Just, it's just look, yeah, sorry. Just explain it to the kids. Kids, your parents are not lying. I promise. So, a3. Liam doesn't like it very much. Okay, Liam uh, really finds this uncomfortable, but here's the problem. Even though you didn't give your opponent connected pawns, you've given your opponent an entry point. Anytime you want to activate rooks, what you should look for is pawn breaks, because now the A file is here, and the tide is turning, turning completely. Because even though Liam is continually pushing for an advantage, Duda's playing rook A3, his rook is about to gobble gobble all these juicy white pawns on the fourth rank, B4, E4, F4, H4, and black is actually better. So here comes Duda. Bishop f2, king e8. His king walks out to d8. What? How is that possible? And sometimes in chess, when you've been better for the whole game, you can't take your foot off the gas. You just simply don't know how to do it. So Liam is still pushing forward. But Duda is just taking. He's like, all right, you, you, you come closer. I'm just going to defend. The king is dancing around somehow still safe. Right? The knight is giving me a million checks. My king keeps running. My king keeps running. I mean, Duda's king is just like, nope, 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 nope. And now he's on c7, all right? And now Duda's like, I'm the attacker now. c3 check. Rook h1. Bishop takes e4. Rook takes b1. Bishop to... Where did Liam... What? Where did his pieces go? Where did Liam's pieces go? A move ago, five moves ago, he had all his pieces. He just lost his pawn in the middle. He lost his bishop on b1, and he lost his knight on f5. Huh? Where did all his pieces go? Insane defending skills by Duda, who wins this game. And this was the only decisive game in the match. Liam was unable to break through. Duda is a wicked, creative, and solid defender. And he is our first finalist. Which brings me to our final matchup of the day between none other than Magnus Carlsen and Ding Li Ren. What would happen? In this matchup. Now, their first two games were draws. We're not going to cover those games. We're going to look at the last two games of the match. Magnus begins with d4. We have a Catalan. Now, Ding Li Ren plays the Catalan himself, but Magnus Carlsen played the Catalan in the World Championship match. Nobody owns an opening, right? Bishop b4 check. Bishop back to e7. This is a main line, forcing the opponent's bishop to a kind of uncomfortable square. But on move 9 of this game, something really funny happened. Because Magnus, in a Catalan, did not castle, did not develop his queenside knight, but played the move h4. It really seems nowadays that you can do this whenever you want. And then Magnus proceeded like nothing happened. He takes on d5. Ding Li Ren attacks him on the queen side with the move b5, trying to go b4, reactivating his bishop. Magnus says, nope. Rook c8, rook fc1. Why rook fc1? Why would you play rook fc1? Well, because you have no battle on the king side. There's no battle there. h4 was a decent gaining of space, and maybe in the future... In the end game, this move will actually come in handy and will be proven that Magnus is a genius. But for now, the battle on the queen side is where we need both the rooks. So rook fc1, the queen moves out of the way of the black rook. We have knight back to a2, and now we begin uh, the, the real kind of peace transfer, the bishop coming back to f1, right? Rook takes rook, rook takes rook, and now it really doesn't matter which rook you had put on c1. Queen a8, the bishop goes to c7. Bishop c7 is such a disrespectful move. It's such a disrespectful move. Bishop c7 is so funny. It prevents black from moving knight b6, but also it prepares potentially bishop a5 and bishop to b4. Trading off black's good bishop. Between black's two, piece, two bishops, five of black's seven pawns are on light squares, which means the light squared bishop is not very good, right? So Magnus prepares a maneuver to trade off Ding Li Ren's uh, good bishop with the move bishop b4. That is why his bishop is on a5 right now. It goes around bishop c7 to trade and also to just control squares. I mean, Magnus, is, his chess is so annoying. It's just so annoying to deal with because now what do you do? You cannot move two pieces. If you move your knight to f5, you just, this is a bad trade for black. That bishop is horrible. So knight b6, knight c1. Dingley run makes some counterplay, but Magnus is right there. He's just slightly better. He's constantly torturing you, but Ding is no slouch. 
and Ding attacks A4, freezes the opportunity for any of Magnus's pieces to go to B3, and locks down his pawns. It's anybody's game. Magnus decides, I want to take on C4. Ding takes on C4. He's like, Magnus, what are you doing? Sometimes when a player puts up big resistance to Magnus, it makes Magnus do something a little drastic. And in this case, why did he activate Black's Bishop? Right? Knight b4. This is why. Because he seems to think that even though he got rid of the black bishop, he's still more active and he's still able to apply pressure. But Ding Liran is playing like a machine. Equal on all four. It's 0-0-0. Zero, zero, zero. Fighting back for 30 moves from a slightly unpleasant position. King f3. Magnus is marching his king forward. Ding Liran plays e5. What? is going on. Knight into d5, a bishop trade. The knight lands on d4. Ding Liren calmly. King f8, I'm also gonna bring my king. The position is completely equal. Both knights, like yin and yang, hanging in the middle of the board. Who's gonna win this damn game? This is insane. It's 0-0-0. Zero, zero, zero. It's 0-0-0. Zero, zero, zero. What is gonna happen? Is Magnus gonna crack under the impression that he needs to defeat Ding Liren at all costs? Ding Liren even meets him in the middle with f5. Look at this position. Two F pawns, two, two E and F, E and F, knights, and alternating C pawns. Have you ever seen something like this? Position is zero, zero, zero. It's hanging on a knife's edge. We have F, E5. We have F, E4. E6. You can take it with two things, but both of them have concessions. Knight allows queen F5. Queen allows the, the queen to be hit with the tempo with the move knight to F4. Queen F5. Queen back to D1. Oh my goodness, the knight is hit and back rank problems. Ding Liren plays G5. That is the best move once again. We have HG5, HG5. Magnus takes the knight. Ding takes the knight. Oh my goodness, who is playing this position for a win? C6. The pawn is going. It's now two squares away from queening. Ding can attack the king with F3, but he doesn't want to blockade, so he takes the pawn. He now has queen F3 opportunities. We have C7. King F7. Queen A7 threatening a discovered check when the pawn promotes. The king King runs to g6. Queen e3. Why did I pause? Because now Magnus wins the g-pawn. And now Magnus is threatening queen f2. Trading the queens. And if you step away, Magnus is threatening queen h3. His king is safe from checks. If you check him, the king hides on the h-file behind the queen. Ding Liren's own pawn proves to be the deciding factor between him being able to force a draw and Magnus watching his c-pawn grow into the beautiful butterfly from the caterpillar that it was. And the promotion is unavoidable and Ding Liren resigns. Oh my gosh. That was so high level. Ding Liren blunders here. He had to put his king on f Six. He also apparently could have given a check and forced the draw this way, but he had to be he had to find the way how. And the way forward was g2, h2, and you can queen. And apparently it's just a draw. You can you can sacrifice and you have a draw somehow with moves like queen h5. But it's it's not always so clear because it looks like the king might escape, but it's a draw. And it's just a draw. Dingley runs so close. But now he has to bounce back. And he has to win with the white pieces. Is he able to do that on demand to force a playoff? We have a Slav defense, a semi-Slav defense by Magnus. Magnus plays a super unpopular variation and setup with the bishop on e7 uh, instead of bishop d6 and traditional stuff. Although I think bishop g5, bishop e7 is fine. Um, but as early as move 10, the players had a completely new position. And opposite side, well, actually, opposite side castling looks like it might happen. But Magnus takes on c4 here and then plays b5 and he's like, well, it's obvious that Magnus is going to castle uh, kingside. Like, how can you play all these moves in front of your king and then castle long? And Magnus does it. Ding Li Ren must have um, realized that this king is in the middle, so he might as well go attack. And he goes and attacks and Magnus goes long castles. Now, white here can play a couple of moves. White can play g takes. White can also continue excuse me, continue pushing to g6 and splitting the pawns like this. I am actually kind of shocked Ding didn't play this. Uh, maybe he thought Magnus would go f6 and somehow it's kind of difficult to get into the black position. But just visually speaking, g6 looks so nice because gh6 looks interesting. And this trade also looks interesting. And these pawns look kind of split, but I just don't know how you're going to get to them. But that's why he's Ding Liren and I'm Gotham Chess. And watch what he does. He plays bishop back to e2. Do you know what the point of bishop e2 is? Bishop e2 has nothing to do with the bishop. Bishop e2 is a golden ticket for the queen to go to h7 and absolutely beat the crap out of everybody. Parents, you can 
Also, teach your kids about that word today. Rook to h8 covers that, but rook h8 is a depressing move because white will play rook c1 and switch the tempo completely. So, Magnus plays f5. That is a ultra committal decision. Dingley Ren attacks that center of the board and begins playing rook c1. Now, make no mistake, white is absolutely better. Why is white absolutely better? Because of the passive nature of the black pieces and the split pawns. So, white is better. Queen f4. Knight fd2, but Magnus says... What? Gotham? Ding should not have played a move like a3. He should have played it slow. He should have respected my infiltration. He should have maybe played g3. Because now that you've allowed my queen to get here. Remember when you called my bishop passive? c5. You might control that more than me, but my tactical opportunities in this position exist, and I hit both knights. When, this, when, when all this opens up, I'm going to hit both knights. So Ding tries to kick the queen out and then take but it doesn't help. It doesn't help. Because you take on c5. I mean, there's the, the rook is always taking the knight at the end of the day. It can take the knight now. You can also play bishop c5, queen f5, pawn f5, rook c5, rook d2. Oops. So, bishop f3, rook c8. Takes, takes. We have a big trade. But at the end of the day, this is only an endgame that black can win. And Ding can't make a draw. So, Ding tries his hardest. To win, of course, if he didn't want to try his hardest, he could have just played pawn takes f4, bishop takes f2, and even here, black is still playing for a win with his outside pass pawn, but there are drawing chances, but Ding decides to go out with a bang, and uh, yeah, I mean, Magnus is actually just winning here. <laughs> um, there's bishop e3 check, and uh, the knight is won, and Ding Li Ren resigns. Not as, you know, convincing of a game as the fourth, as the third one, the third one was incredible. Uh, Ding and Magnus put on incredible displays of, of, of chess dominance when they play. That, that, that third game could have made a game on its own. I mean, it was so tense. It was unbelievably high strung. They were playing at such a high level. And Ding, obviously, I mean, he's playing this final game at like four in the morning or some ridiculous time in China. Um, that's obviously, I mean, I'm not trying to put excuses for the guy. Magnus was the better player, of course. But uh, yeah, I mean, these two guys really make some amazing memories together. Uh, okay, this is starting to sound like some romantic chess novel. I will see you all back tomorrow for the finals. It's Duda, it's Magnus, and uh, it's Gotham Chess Recaps. I'll see you all tomorrow. Get out of here.